Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at TexasConflictCoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening or tweet us at TX Conflict Coach. Churches and their congregational members are not immune to conflict and the collateral damage that can be caused from unresolved heart issues, which often grow into untamed monsters. In this episode, Understanding and Preventing Conflict, Staying Out of the Mediation Emergency Room, we will speak with Dale Pine, CEO of Peacemaker Ministries. Peacemaker's mission is to equip and assist Christians in their churches to understand prevent, and respond to conflict biblically. We will also discuss how mediation is often the triage or emergency room to dealing with conflict and will identify the guiding biblical principles and steps to address these types of issues. Tonight, we do have our chat room open at blogtalkradio.com forward slash conflict coach. And we invite you to participate in our Twitter feed using hashtag TCC Radio. I am your co-host, Yvette Jenkins. Here with me is host Patty Porter and special guest, Dale Pine. Patty and Dale, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you, Yvette. Thank you, Yvette. I'm looking forward to co-hosting with you. And Dale, thank you so much for being with us for as part of our series. My pleasure. It's an honor. Thank you. Well, welcome. All right, so we'll get started. So, Dale, for years you've worked in the corporate world and in the court as a mediator and arbitrator. How did you find yourself moving into peacemaking? Well, I will say it was uh, either accidental or providential. I'm going to go with providential. You know, my, the corporate world experience that I had was with Harley-Davidson, and uh, in that world there are very successful uh, business people. It's a Fortune 100 organization, and there are very independent Harley-Davidson dealers, and independent is an understatement. They're just independent. <laughs> and so uh, being the liaison between those two entities uh, allowed me to spend uh, an entire career in understanding what makes people people's clock tick and and understanding that, uh, that there can be two people in the right, but it still doesn't work or there's miscommunication. And we, when we oftentimes need to go outside of ourselves to seek help. So, but the, true, the manner in which I ended up in, in Christian conciliation was from an experience I had when I came to church one Sunday morning. And I learned um, that we had a guest speaker. So our pastor simply said, uh, this is going to be a very difficult Sunday for all of us, if you would please just sit down, uh, put your seat belts on, and pray, and listen. And so he introduced a pastor from another church, and that pastor shared the gospel. He shared, um, he reminded us of, of the Ten Commandments. He reminded us that we're all fallen and broken, that no one's perfect, and that God's grace is the only thing that brings us uh, into relationship with Him and forgiveness. And then he introduced uh, Mike, our youth pastor of 13 years, and Mike spent the next 15 minutes confessing his moral failure. That's something that's pretty difficult to do, period, let, do, let alone do it in front of an entire congregation. Um, during this process, so I'm a business analyst, and I'm thinking, what in the world has happened here? How did, how did we get to this point? How, what were the elders doing? What, what, what about the staff? What about the parents of the children that this man was leading? What questions are in their minds? And what is the press going to do with this mess? Because we are the largest church in town. And uh, you know, I thought through all of those things, but was still heavily drawn back into Mike's confession, which was genuine. It was transparent. 
everything that needed to be said, no unnecessary disclosures. But uh, in the process, he admitted that <clears throat> what he did could have impact on the church and on people's relationship with God and their trust in man and, and, and leaders in the church. He also had already surrendered his position in the church, and he also put himself under the authority of the elders, which is a biblical uh, position that most churches would take when there's res restoration opportunities. And so after Mike finished that, the pastor um, asked Mike's wife and children who were in the front row to come up so that uh, you know we could pray for them. And when he did that, uh, the entire congregation, uh, without invitation, came up and really enveloped them. And I will say that my uh, my reason for getting up and going forward, I frankly, wasn't for the family. It was for Mike because he was so broken and so hurt, and I was so uh, impacted by his honesty and his transparency. So that confession caused me to desire uh, to forgive him, to help him see him through um, to the future. And the things that I learned after that were that a peacemaker had come in from a church down the street and had spent uh, several months working through the challenges and issues, both relational and substantive, uh, and the impact from <clears throat> from all of those uh, with the church. And it was that peacemaker that did the 15-minute uh, introduction that morning. And he was just a young man, uh, really didn't know too much. He had just finished our training, but he just stepped forward in faith and gave himself uh, to the church for quite a period of time. So it was impressive. It was impactful. I will tell you that uh, seven, eight years later, um, the pastor was restored. He's back working in the right place in the church for him, and uh, and things turned out well. The press never mentioned uh, the issue or the problem, although we never mm -hmm. concealed it. And the church didn't blow up or shrink or split. It actually grew because uh, the, the congregation came together instead of splitting apart in argument. I was so impressed with um, the impact of a biblical approach to a very difficult situation that I had to learn more, and one thing led to another, and here I am. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you for sharing your personal story with our listening audience, from how you came from the corporate world to now you are part of Peacemakers Ministries. Um, so about Peacemakers industry, uh, Ministries, can you tell us what your mission is? Sure. Our mission is to equip and assist Christians and their churches in understanding, preventing, and responding to conflict biblically. And so that's new for us. It used to be in responding to conflict biblically. And what we okay. recognized is that um, mediation or arbitration was the emergency room. And we can talk more about that later if you like. But for us, uh, our goal now is to help individuals, you and I, because we each have our brokenness. We're just all broken. Uh, I haven't met the perfect person yet, not the perfect spouse, not the perfect employer, not the perfect employee, and nor have I ever been any of the above. And so uh, recognizing the brokenness, the, the mission of the, church, of the ministry now is to help people understand what, what conflict is born out of, why it happens, and then to recognize it quickly so that we can address it uh, quickly instead of letting it grow. The ministry has four primary parts. Uh, the first, um, we, were, we were born out of the Christian Legal Society, so it was a lot of engineers, a lot of attorneys, mostly attorneys, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of linear thinking analytics, and um, they uh, were compelled to do this because of uh, a passage in Scripture uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 6, that just says, you know, what Paul asked the question, why are you taking each other to court? Wouldn't it be better to have someone in the church, even the lowest person in the church, help with, with, with your problem versus mm -hmm. having the whole world knowing about it versus you airing all of these issues in public and then letting someone who maybe doesn't even know Christ uh, solve your dispute for you. So that was the impetus for Peacemaker Minute. That was its birth. So today, the four areas that we serve in are, of course, case uh, work, so case administration management, and we do, um, oh, you name it, um, individuals, marriages, organizations, 
churches, many, many churches, parachurch ministries, government agencies, tribes. Um, the ministry spans 60 countries and 23 languages. In, in the last 30 years, <clears throat> we're not in 60 countries today. And um, so we have the services th that we provide, that is conflict coaching, that's pre-mediation, then mediation arbitration. We have a certification process through the Institute for Christian Conciliation for those that want to learn and understand how to approach conflict in a biblical way, not neutral, but for Christ and helping others see that. We do resources, many books, DVDs, workbooks, uh, guides, uh, and, and that's a pretty significant part of our ministry because it's global and translated. And, um, and then we train. We have a certification program, as I mentioned, that would take a conciliator through a, uh, a moderate process, more so than the average conciliator's 40 and 20 hours for, in preparation for work in a, in a state court system, for instance. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing the your four different areas. So just wanted to um, just confirm. So you said there the four are the you do resources, training, and education. You have an institute for the Christian conciliation and um, a certification um, you mentioned. Right, the certification program. Okay. And, and then, then we just um, have our, our, our internal uh, administration and development. So okay. I hate to call them divisions because division sounds like such a bad title to use for an organization that's called to bring people together. <laughs> Teams. Patty, was there anything you wanted to add? Um, I think the, what I wanted to say at this point, thank you, Yvette, uh, before I, I we continue our conversation, is, you know, that, that was such a powerful story listening to you, uh, Dale, uh, about Mike, because I, as you were actually telling the story, I felt myself sitting there on the bench and, and feeling a lot of pain in my heart just for what was happening for his vulnerability uh, and, and sharing that brokenness, you know. And, and when you said the thing, we are all broken, we're not perfect, at first it hit me hard when you said that, and then I was just like, you know, but that's very true. None of us are perfect. And then how, what do we use, you know, if, if, if we are a Christian, what do we use to help us biblically understand, as you said, prevent and respond to conflict biblically? And, uh, and so in carrying on the conversation then, the ministry itself has served thousands of churches. And actually you're very, very well known around the world. Um, and when I talk to a lot of my own colleagues who do this work, uh, Peacemaker Ministries. In fact, it just came up the other day. We had an attorney who said, we are looking for a Christian faith-based mediator. Do you know anyone? And so I'm like, you know, I'm not a family mediator, and I'm, you know, talking to my colleagues, and they're like, yes, we went to the Peacemaker Ministries and got certified. I'm like, there you go. There it comes again, you know. So you're very, very well known, and there's a lot of people who are uh, very strong in uh, their understanding and belief in the work that y'all do. So in having served the thousands of churches that y'all are doing, wh and you've been with them for uh, quite some time now, what are the kinds of conflicts that you find that are common in churches that you've been dealing with? Well, the outward signs of the conflict, you know, there are just as many as there are days in a year. I think probably the most common uh, would be born out of uh, moral failures, uh, of generally of pastors uh, or uh, church leaders, somehow involving the church itself. Um, there's often there are oftentimes disputes over theological issues, and you know that's a difficult uh, area to work in because, frankly, the church has been fighting over theology since um, the beginning. <laughs> Since, mm. since the time in Scripture, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a difficult one. So when we, when we work in casework like that, we have to have subject matter experts. But polity as well, that would be church policy management, uh, how their, the denomination affiliation has to determined they're going to govern uh, the body, and in some cases the bodies are governed uh, by the members, and other times they're governed by a board of elders and in some cases they're governed by the senior pastor themselves and that of course uh, is is a source for conflict to grow interestingly actually we have uh, uh, taking all uh, all of those combined tradition 
is one that comes up more often than we we would imagine because tradition is just something um the phrase you would hear because that's the way we've always done it mm. <laughs> and it's not theology it's not polity it's not law it's just uh, this is what this is what we always used to do and i don't like change so uh the challenge with the i don't like change people is they're generally the senior um uh, members uh, who may be influencers within the organization not just uh in leadership roles but also financially so there are there's sometimes some uh, blackmail <laughs> that can happen mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. when anyone regardless of age or reason uh doesn't like the change but i would say all of this is you know i, I we certainly we we can't forget about power and control power and control is just that's what some people uh, need and so there are those that that's I know that's a pretty broad spectrum but it's really uh, a pretty good representation of uh, the catalyst for a lot of the conflict in church. So one of the things, you know, and we've heard this because we've been doing the church series in February um and there seems to be a pattern especially around the whole uh, change piece of it and, cert- and certainly these are some of the common conflicts in churches some of them really big conflicts, you know, when you talk about theological issues and policies and tradition and things of that nature. And so there is a broad range of issues. Now, in the in the community of the church, what is some common issues? Because, you know, one of the things you talk about is this brokenness and heart issues. Can you speak more to that and how that ties into the comment that you made earlier about mediation is often the emergency room or the triage? Talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, well, one of the verses is that I like to mention is in James, it's uh, chapter 4, verse 1, he asks this question. He says, what causes fights and what causes quarrels among you? Now, James is talking to believers, uh, you know, so it's not like a boxing match in the street from, you know, a bad drug deal. Um, James is asking believers, why do you fight? And and then the response is, is it not the desires uh, that are held within your heart? And and then he goes on to say, you fight and you quarrel and, and sometimes you even kill because of those desires, because you're unwilling to see someone else's needs. And, you know, we could call desires in in some uh, in some cases, or maybe many cases in the church, a good thing. So James isn't saying having a desire is a bad thing, because we can desire to have a church that's growing and loving and serving. We can desire to have a pastor that uh, that teaches well. We can desire to have a congregation that listens well. Uh, or for a children's ministry to grow. All good desires, but if in the name of uh, growing the children's ministry, uh, I would attack someone else for not performing uh, in a manner that was inconsistent with our calling, that is to love God and love others, uh, to be patient, to be kind, to be um, forgiving, <laughs> and be willing to overlook. Um, I don't, I don't want to... I guess I, I don't want to go down uh, a, a rabbit trail, but I do want to say that we talk about a progression of an idol, and uh, the idol starts with desire. So the heart issue or idol is, I want something good for this church. I want it so bad that I'm going to push hard for it. And oftentimes when we push hard, um, you know, we can stretch the boundaries or the limits of um, of rightness or righteousness. And so then we might uh, say something to someone else about the way they perform. And uh, when they don't respond well, when, when we don't get what we want, when our desire uh, is not met, then we start to demand. And when we start to demand is when we begin breaking relationship. And that's when it all, I, I wish we could uh, have flares go up in congregations when the desire shifts from a good thing to a bad thing because God would not ever and has not ever asked us to do something um, that compromises the two greatest commandments, love God, love others. Uh, So Mm -hmm. love God, love others, except for now because we want to add a wing onto the church and we just need to do it and we just need to borrow the money even though the church policy is that we would not ever be in debt. 
And mm. so that's so that desire turns into demand. When we demand things of people and they don't respond, we get upset because uh, it's embarrassing, it's prideful, it's whatever, it's fear, whatever it is. And then we start to judge them. So we judge them by saying, you don't, you're not committed, uh, you know, whatever the language could be. And finally, uh, we go beyond judgment to persecution where we might terminate someone or work against them or work against their mission or gossip about them or email or Facebook or whatever else we do today that we might not have done 50 years ago. But it's the same thing. So the progression of an idol is I desire, and it could be a good thing. Of course, it could be a bad thing. I, I demand when my desire is not met. When I don't get a response that's positive, I begin to judge the other persons that are resisting me. And after I judge, or while I'm judging them, I begin to persecute them. And so, you know, we talk about escaping and attacking from, from our, our, our conflicts. We can escape and run, or we can attack. And, you know, the ultimate escape is suicide. The ultimate attack is murder. But there's so much in between. And those heart issues are the core uh, of, well, why do, why do we need this? Why, so you have this desire. It's a good thing. But, you know, in your heart, what is the most important thing? And what happens is, you know, we call an idol something that replaces God on the throne of our values or our life. And so we create these idols, and we do it, really, we do it every day. We do it sometimes when we're driving down the road and someone falls in front of us. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, but, I, you know, I really like the way that you lined that out. You know, I desire, if my desire is not met, I demand. We tend to do that. I judge, I persecute, and like you said, you either escape or attack. And so I, I appreciate you making that parallel to how what that means when you talk about heart issues. Um, and um, so let me just uh, just do a quick interruption right here because we have a number of people in our uh, chat room and we've got the Twitter feed going. And I thank everyone for joining us here and doing that and listening to Dale. And I appreciate uh, that being here with me to co-host. So you are uh, listening to the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio Program, and we are talking with Dale Pine with Peacemaker Ministries, and we're just referring to him as Peacemaker here. Um, so Dale started to mention some things around some biblical principles. So Yvette, why don't you pick up from here then? Sure. So earlier you spoke about heart issues. What are the guiding biblical principles to address these heart issues? Well, I'm really glad you asked. <laughs> so first, it's really important to remind uh, you that I'm not a theologian. I don't ever want to be. I think uh, it's a good thing to study Scripture. But what I am is just very passionate about relationships and relationships going well and broken relationships being healed. And, you know, if we can look at Scripture, <clears throat> we can recognize that we do escape, that we do attack, um, and neither are correct. There are a couple of scriptures that are, are foundational for peacemaker ministries that would be the catalyst to we need to do something here so not if but when conflict arises and not if but when we handle it poorly um we have to ask a question you know we're in conflict there are two two ways that we can know that we're in conflict we can be upset with someone else because they've done something mm-hmm. or um we can hear through the grapevine that someone else is upset with us. And in Matthew, uh, both of these situations are addressed. In fact, they overlap. So ideally, if we could really live and walk and breathe and uh, our talk of being Christ followers, we would recognize that we're in Matthew 18, 15. If someone's offended you, go to them, but go to them in person. And don't go to them to tell them how wrong they are. Go to them to ask the question, um, do, do I understand this right, or am, am I understanding what you're saying or thinking or doing correctly, so that you do seek to understand what is actually going on? And if it's affirmed that it's inconsistent with what you think is correct or it's offending you, then you would say, this is troublesome to me and here's why. So that's just a practical application of Matthew 18.15. It says, go to them individually. If they hear you, then you have made a friend and all is well. And you know, from there it says, uh, if that doesn't work out, um, then bring one or two others. And so normally when we take Matthew 18 and it's applied in churches, uh, it's probably one of the most misapplied uh, parts of, our, of verses in, in Scripture. Uh, 
people think, well, we need to get Luigi and Guido <laughs> to mm-hmm. go with us to tell someone how bad they are. Uh, and and actually, that's not that's not what is being conveyed there. What's being conveyed is go, you know, bring someone else that you trust that is strong enough and bold enough to look you in the eye and say, oh, Dale, you're missing something here. Mm-hmm. Here's what I'm hearing from this other party, and it's not what you think is going on. Or actually, uh, the other party may be correct. So that's why we would bring one or two more. And that, by the way, from a Christian conciliation perspective, is that's where conflict coaching and or mediation could, could enter into a biblical uh, resolution to a conflict. But the other side that I mentioned earlier is if you are aware through gossip or Facebook or something else that someone else is upset with you, in mm-hmm. Matthew 5.23, he says, uh, if, if you know that someone is offended by you, leave your gift at the altar. That means there's nothing more important in the middle of, you know, your, your church, your, your worship. Uh, don't come here and worship God. Don't worship me if you know that someone is offended by something you've done. And it's clear, it's important to clear up that it's not if you know that someone is offended and you agree they should be. <laughs> it's if you know that someone is offended. Mm-hmm. And so uh, if we could recognize that we're called to go, but go for a reason, we're called to respond if we hear someone else has a problem and we want to respond uh, in love to go seek to understand to resolve the conflict, that's good. I know I'm going to run us out of time, and I don't want to do that. But there's, you know, uh, Proverbs 19:11 talks about overlooking, and today we don't overlook very well. Um, it says it's to a man's glory to overlook an offense, and if we truly can overlook, then that's just a great thing to do. But there are things that just, there are some things that simply cannot be overlooked, and that's when we would go to someone else and and present the challenge. But in the process, we would want to look at all of the scripture. In, including those helpful ones like loving our brother, forgiving like we have been forgiven, uh, you know, taking the log out of our own eye, very significant. You might hear more about that next week. And uh, and we want to understand our part in this. So if we are only 10% of the problem and the other party is 90% of the problem, we want to own 100% of our 10%. That's what getting the log out of your own eye means. It's not so you can just quit and forgive. It's so you can get the log out of your own eye, clear up your own stuff, confess that, and then help someone else with the issues that they have as well. Because the 90% is big, and it shouldn't just be dismissed, probably. Thank you for providing that. I think that is very important, ownership of your own actions. Um, I think that is very important, and we should definitely take heed to that. Um, At this point, I'm going to pass. Um, the show over to Patty for additional comments or questions. Yes. I think what we'll do, Dale, is we will combine um, the steps and the assignment for the week, because I know you have something very specific. So as we start to go, and we'll go just a little bit over, not too much, but what are some of the steps that could guide folks, and is there any of those steps or something that you want to give to our listeners as a fieldwork assignment? Uh, yeah, I, I would love to do this. First, you know, I've, I've said it often enough in this brief t- in our brief time together that conflict is it's um, and God uses conflict in, in in awesome ways. And if we can embrace conflict and recognize it, that this is an opportunity for personal growth, even spiritual growth, then it's a it's a good thing. So my challenge would be to, you know, when conflict comes our way, can we can we look at it from a different perspective? Instead of taking the low road and doing the attacking and going down the path that we might go on and attacking is, comes in all forms like Facebook or gossip or email or personal uh, words, but what, what is your high road? And determine, you know, discern what is your high road. If I was going to do this differently, if I really believe that there is a God, and if God is in me, and if God is the power in me, and if I recognize that I can't do this on my own, but I can do anything through him, then why don't I surrender this to him and surrender my pride, look look to him, ask for his him coming, you know, James 1 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And how many times 
a day do I come and say, God, I don't know what to do here in this business decision, in this mediation, in this arbitration, talking with this person, talking with my spouse or my children. I don't know what to do. I lack the wisdom. Will you show me a different way than what I feel right now, which is I know not good. And so the second step would be to reflect with that power that God gives us to reflect where am I in this and what part do I own and why do I feel this way? Why do I insist that we be on time? Or why do I insist that everything be neat and orderly? And recognize that I need to, I'm making idols or gods out of neatness and, and timeliness. Um, and then I can go out and, and go. So I'm going to encourage the, the participants here to uh, ascend, that's go to God first, reflect, where am I in this and why? and then connect in a different way. So seeking to understand, you know, we want to speak the language of the listener. And that is that we know what we're saying, we're not, we know what we're thinking, but if we speak eloquent French, but they only speak Italian, <laughs> it doesn't matter how well we speak, we're not communicating. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> seeking to understand how the listener thinks and breathes and maybe recognizing that we have no clue what their history is, family history, childhood history, current work situations, current home situations. We just do not know. And to offer that benefit of the doubt and to seek to understand who they are. So ascend, reflect, connect. And that can happen over and over and over in one conversation. Mm -hmm. So my assignment would be to practice doing that before it happens because when it happens, it's not our first inclination. (laughs) Yeah, we go to our default behavior, whatever that might be, right? Escape or attack. (laughs) Okay, very good. So listeners, you have your assignments. You have three simple steps to practice, practice, practice. What is your high road? And uh, Dale, what is some things that you really want to highlight for folks to know? Maybe it's uh, because you have a number of resources, workbooks, workshops, conferences. What would you like to highlight for folks now? (laughs) Well, we have a conference every year. It's in Colorado. It's a wonderful place for conciliators to come and get training, meet with other conciliators. Most of our conciliators are counselors, attorneys, pastors. So it's pretty broad spectrum. Some of us are business people like I was. So the conference is great. The training is wonderful. The book or resource that I think that is by far our most popular is called Resolving Everyday Conflict. The book is only 100 pages. It can be accompanied or or purchased separately from a workbook um, and DVD that takes a group of you know it could be a married couple or a group of people through uh, an eight session process uh, of doing kind of the things that I was just talking about, but going much deeper in depth in some scripture and and studies. Very affordable, very effective, very popular. Resolving everyday conflict, and that's on you know you can find that at our bookstore. So we're our um, web address is peacemaker.net. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that, Yvette. Thank you, Dale. Um, So you provided us with our assignment for the week and your contact information. What final message would you like to leave with our listeners this evening? Uh, Peace is possible. And when we're helping others, since I'm I'm talking primarily with conflict coaches or conciliators, uh, we too can grow our own idols. And they come out in mediation in the form of um, a desired resolution. So I think someone should acquiesce. I think someone should confess. I think someone should uh, just get over it. And we actually can become a part of the problem. So don't grow your own idols while you're helping others work through their idols. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Patty, thank you for letting me co-host. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.